Caribou and their calves observe us from a safe distance. Perhaps as curious about us as we are of them. Moving deeper into Kulawani, well beyond the gaze of those traveling the highway, in the heart of the St. Elias Mountains, there is a magnificent Arctic world. Ribbons of ice merging, grinding, and twisting their way downward, looking like roads, but these are glaciers. Some measure five miles across. This land of ice and snow, perforated by mountains, is home to the largest non-polar ice field in the world. Mount Logan rises above the rest to an elevation of 19,525 feet. Kluwani Park interpreter, Allison Wood. Mount Logan is a very, very interesting feature of the park. It's not only the highest mountain in Canada, but it's also in mass and volume considered the largest mountain in the world, which uh, many Canadians aren't aware of. It was the belief of the Southern Toshone that glaciers were supernatural beings. It was taboo to fry meat while camping near the ice. The frying of meat, it was believed, would cause the glacier to move down the valley to eat the food. Only boiled meat was allowed. Kluwani is also known for its ice fields. Kluwani does have the largest ice fields outside of a polar region. There's a number of different kinds of glaciers in the park. There's valley glaciers, uh, cirque glaciers, tidewater glaciers, Piedmont glaciers. So for anyone who's interested in looking at very different shapes and forms, the glaciers are a fascinating aspect of the park. Again, this is something you don't see from the highway. Kluwani Park headquarters, located in the town of Haines Junction, is a good starting point for one's journey of discovery into Kluwani. Park interpreters are on duty here to assist travelers who visit here from all over the world. Across the road from park headquarters is the village bakery and deli a sweet tooth oasis for travelers and locals. There, I took all the calories out of this recipe. Liz and Boyd Campbell own and operate the village bakery in Delhi. They <gasps> moved here for the quality of life and the opportunity this area presented. There was land available, there was, uh, there was opportunities, there was uh, businesses to, that you could build. There was no competition at all. If, if you built something and did something, you were the only one that was doing it. Uh, so that was, uh, to me, that was the, the most attractive part about it. The Campbells, like the other business owners in this area, are heavily dependent on the tourist trade. Boyd believes Kluwani will experience an increase in tourism. This area is just starting to become uh, known now as more of a, of a destination point. Up until now, it's been just a, a, basically a gas stop. Uh, for people going to, to Alaska. One of the largest, if not the largest, uh, protected area in uh, the world. So uh, this area will become more of a destination uh, all through the end of the 1990s and into the, into the year 2000. Uh, there'll be more people coming here because it's, uh, it's quieter, there's lots of area, and uh, it's basically, uh, it's, it's a hiker's mecca because there's no, there's, there's no roads uh, uh, that are into the, into the park. There are those who would like to make the wonders of Kluwani National Park more accessible to tourists and locals by building roads into the park, while others would prefer to keep Kluwani a wilderness. Some of us feel that's the nice thing about the park. Of course, there's always pressures from other people wanting to, 
see the glacier, be able to drive up to a glacier, and there is a lot of pressure uh, from some uh, populations to to open the park up. And my personal belief is that what makes Kwani so beautiful and so remarkable. It is that it is a wilderness park, and it you definitely sense its wilderness aspect. And it would be really sad to see that starting to change. The issue of accessibility to the park and many other tourist-related decisions will have to be made by the local people as they strive to strike a balance between quality of life and tourism. Art Papineau has been kicking around this wilderness for 28 years. He's seen a lot of changes and had some great experiences. One that Art recalls for us is the time he and his mining partner, Charlie Ross, were spending the night in a cabin up at Six Mile. During the middle of the night, uh, we had two dogs with us, and uh, they had the dogs tied out on the steps. And uh, anyways, the dogs started whimpering, so Charlie went to the door and he opened the door and there was a big grizzly there. He's a big one. And uh, standing up there about 10 feet from the dogs, eyeing the dogs up. So Charlie went out and I grabbed the gun. I had a gun, 38.55, and I went to the door and I wasn't intending to shoot the bear, but Charlie was about four feet away from the bear and he was talking to it and telling it now, go on ahead up to Squaw Creek and we'll meet you up there in the morning and all this stuff. He talked the bear right down and the bear turned around and got down and walked away and then it kind of looked back just to say, well, who's that old guy? <laughs> he's doing up here, you know. Art moved up here from Vancouver, British Columbia because he loved the natural beauty of the Yukon and the freedoms of a slower pace of life. When his kids come to visit, they are a bit apprehensive of where he lives. You know, they think, well, you live in a place that's dangerous to step outside the door. They don't realize, like, they're raised in the city and they don't realize, well, you know, that's your elbow room. When you step out the door and you can't see your neighbor, you might see smoke. And uh, that's, they don't realize that, that it's, uh, it's a different lifestyle altogether. And to me, it's great, you know. The population of this area has increased quite a bit since Art first came here. He has seen a lot of people move into this territory totally unprepared. People coming from outside and they don't know how to live in the bush and they want to go and build a place in the bush and they go out and they start and then they get discouraged and they quit because they don't realize that uh, when you're in an area like this, especially in the winter time, it's okay, you got the junction 35 miles away, but if you're up anywhere from where I am and up farther up here towards the border, you're pretty well isolated in the winter. Uh, the roads are kept open. So, I mean, you're not really totally isolated, but uh, some people can't even cope with that. Like if you get a storm for a week or so and they're, they're blown in for a week, well, they're, they're uh, apt to get cabin fever or something, whatever you call it. <laughs> 